Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the museum again. It gives me a huge pleasure tonight to introduce a, a, a speaker who's, a, who's actually a local lad who uh, grew up just up the road um, and, and went to the, the local comprehensive school here in, in Oxford um, as part of what I'm sure you won't mind me saying was a rather infamous uh, year group. Um, but then he went, then went on to uh, study biological studies at Edinburgh University before completing a PhD in rat parasites. Um, and it was there whilst working on uh, in John Taylor's uh, plant and microbial biology lab that um, he, he actually chanced upon a conversation with, uh, with a curator of zoology, David Wake, who, uh, who mentioned a, a particularly unpleasant sort of killer fungus that was waging its way across, uh, across um, California, uh, which led him on the path to, uh, to study what's sometimes regarded as really the, the forgotten kingdom of biology, the fungi. Um, that eventually led him to, uh, to a professorship, um, which he holds now at uh, the Department of Infectious Diseases um, and Epidemiology at St Mary's, College, uh, St Mary's Hospital at Imperial College in London. Um, and he leads a research group there that is investigating um, some really interesting organisms. Um, so um, these organisms are a pathogenic fungi that um, really are, uh, are emerging at an incredible rate. Um, and his published work actually covers, uh, covers an enormous amount of, of fungi, but um, it's featured on some of the most um, most prestigious science journals in the world. Um, I think he's had uh, uh, philosophical, the cover of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, Nature, and, and twice got the uh, the, uh, the cover of Science. So it really does make, give me huge pleasure to uh, to introduce you to Professor Matthew Fisher. So Matt, are you there? I am here, and can you hear me, Chris? Lovely. Um, yeah, we have we have sound, and we also have my first slide. Great. Well, thank you so much for that kind invitation. Yes, I am a local lad. Um, I'm calling in from St Mary's Hospital, uh, Imperial College London. It's um, an unexpected benefit of COVID that we're now able to uh, talk to the world. We never used to do these online seminars, and and now we do, and it's a, it's it's wonderful. Um, so I work in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, and my speciality is the fungus among us. Um, and I am going to be talking to you today about fungal catastrophes. And uh, they really are quite catastrophic organisms, as we'll, um, we'll get to grips with. This picture here is uh, of a colleague of mine, uh, Claude Mio, and he is holding the largest frog on the planet. It's the Goliath frog from Cameroon, and he's um, swabbing it. And he's swabbing it for a, in, uh, an infection that we're going to hear about. So um, uh, wonderful, wonderful animals. Um, first of all, let's just get to grips with exactly what uh, fungi are. Um, so uh, they are an entire kingdom, and Chris rightly said they're a neglected kingdom. They're, um, they're, they're not charismatic. They're often um, invisible to the naked eye. They live underground, uh, but they're enormous and they're very, very old. So they're at least a billion years old. So way back then, um, they were aquatic osmotrophic flagellates. So they're little swimming organisms. Um, and so osmotrophs means that uh, unlike Homer Simpson, who eats his donuts and digests them in his stomach, the fungus will secrete a spectacular array of enzymes into their environment. Uh, here are some of the microfossils that we have for fungi. You know, they may have been here for half the age of the earth. There are some uh, unnamed fossils which um, uh, micro uh, um, uh, microfossils through time. Prototaxites on the right here, um, in the Devonian uh, was an extraordinary organism. Those fruiting bodies appear to have been eight meters tall. And uh, so this is, these, are, these were dominating land before land plants had really established themselves. Uh, so, you know, some, some really quite extraordinary organisms, but very old and very, very diverse. So, I don't know, around about 500, um, uh, million years ago, so during the Cambrian explosion, uh, the uh, fungi, some of them lost their flagella 
and they um, became terrestrial organisms. Um, they uh, invaded land and fungi formed this exquisite range of symbioses with plants, uh, the ecto and endomycorrhizal association with roots. So it's probably that symbiosis that really allowed uh, land plants to uh, take off and evolutionarily um, radiate to, 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 to give us the planets that we live in today. Um, the fungi were on land uh, when the first vertebrates hauled themselves out of the waters. So we see there that kind of uh, lizardy creature is Ichthyostega, uh, the proto-amphibian. So the point I'm making here is that fungi were well entrenched by the time that amphibians evolved. So it's an important point now because it means that amphibians have always been in association with fungi and indeed vertebrates have, that's important later. Uh, then fungi radiated to form the basidiomycetes, which are those wonderful uh, ones that we like to buy in the supermarket and eat, the fleshy ones, and then the ascomycetes that uh, rot down our fruit. There's a moldy orange. The important point here is that we've described 150,000 species. There's probably upwards of 5 million out there. So 5% of what's of the fungal biodiversity of the planet has been described. It's a really great place to discover new forms of life if that's uh, what you're interested in. And that is what I'm interested in. So here is a really curious um, ancient fungal catastrophe. It's called the fungal infection mammalian selection hypothesis. And uh, this is a, a thought experiment that a uh, really great philosopher, uh, philosopher, philosopher, biologist, Arturo Castaval from John Hopkins, has, um, has been toying with through um, over the past decade or so. So what Arturo is essentially saying here is that fungi were a key ingredient in the destruction of the dinosaurs, which then opened up all those niches which allowed the mammals to radiate. So um, uh, in, 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 in the end of the Cretaceous, the Chicxul of meteorite impact hit the earth and it caused an extreme global cooling event. Uh, the clouds as it threw up would have shut down photosynthesis. So in essentially um, overnight, the world would have switched to a compost earth. Now at that point, what was there on compost earth, which was gonna do very, very well and wasn't photosynthesizing? Well, of course, that's our friends, the fungi. And uh, one thing that fungi don't do very well is grow at high temperatures. Now, 37 degrees, our body temperature is not a good temperature for most fungi. So, um, which is, that tends to be why we are fairly resilient in the face of them. Now, the dinosaurs would have got very cold very fast. Their immune systems would have shut down. There would have been a heck of a lot of fungal spores in the air, and that would have overwhelmed the dinosaur's immune system. So, you know, whether the degree of involvement with this fungal spore bloom um, knocking over the last of the dinosaurs, well, we'll never know that, but they would definitely have had some impact. And, um, well, certainly that allowed the uh, the niche to open when those little warm, um, squirrely animals uh, would have pulled through and, and, and here we are today. So perhaps fungi and that ancient catastrophe has put us into the uh, driving seat um, in the Anthropocene. So there is actually a little bit of evidence for this. And that's if you go to the KT boundary, you see that there is where the meat, when the meteorite struck, there was a very thick layer of fungal spores uh, in the uh, in the Iridium KT boundary layer. So the compost earth um, did exist, and uh, you know that's when we lost the dinosaurs. So moving to the present, I mean, I always get criticized for my fungal bashing but you know i'm a disease biologist i'm a disease epidemiologist that's where my uh, that's where my mind goes but we need to establish that fungi are not only friendly organisms but utterly essential for the healthy um ecosystem functioning of the planet so the wood wood wide web as it's sometimes called that wonderful uh, mycorrhizal association between fungi and plants allows uh, healthy forests, 
and it also produces an enormous amount of mushrooms, which uh, which people uh, rely on for food around the world. It's uh, it's good, readily available protein. So these women here are collecting chanterelles in the Zambian Miombo uh, dry tropical forests. Then uh, in Zambia is a country that I grew up in and has some of the finest and most delectable mushrooms on the planet. Without fungi and their uh, osmotrophic lifestyle, wood just wouldn't rot. So they produce those heavy duty enzymes, which you know fire along the ecosystem function of uh, degrading dead wood. Um, and, and so that we, we have them absolutely uh, in, inextricably uh, involved in nutrient recycling. And they form these wonderfully elegant symbioses. So you've got some lichens here. But of course, um, you know, tree, trees and trees and their uh, their actinomycorrhizal fungi or another, another symbiosis. And where would we be without the antimicrobials? So this little petri dish here is Alexander Fleming's original plate. So those are colonies of Staphylococcus aureus, the bacteria, and then there's the contaminant, Penicillium chrysogenum, and that of course happened here in St Mary's uh, Hospital in Alexander Fleming's lab. And that unique event and him recognizing that it was uh, that this 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 fungus was destroying bacteria using some natural product um, allowed the discovery of penicillin and kickstarted the antimicrobial revolution. And here we are. And then finally, they produce other very useful products. And where would it be without some uh, ethanol produced by a fungus Saccharomyces? to relax at the end of the day. So these friendly fungi are detailed in this lovely book that Merlin Sheldrake has, um, has, has just written, Entangled Life. So you should definitely go there and, uh, and, and catch up on the fungal story as it is today. But as well as being friendly organisms, they're also terrible foes. And this is where we're going to dwell um, on today. So, as we see, they have been causing amphibian extinctions and bat declines, but also perennially um, fungi attack uh, at, attack trees. Uh, at the moment, uh, Britain and Europe is in the grip of an uh, ash dieback epidemic. Uh, we're likely to lose, you know, maybe 30% of our forest cover. It's a very numerous tree, and there's almost no survival in the face of uh, of um, uh, Calara fraxinea, uh, fungal invasion from Asia, apparently it appears. Um, and farmers are always battling fungi in their crops. So we perennially have to spray our crops with a wide array of uh, fungicides in order to defend these monocultures. And if we don't get that right, then we have crop failures and famines. And in hospitals, some um, you know, uh, clinicians are terrified of patients getting fungal infections they're really, really hard to treat and the loss of life can be high. So they are really quite, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's a real yin and yang to the fungus. We can't live with them, um, but we also can't live without them. So I, I, I alluded to the extraordinarily um, kind of undiscovered nature of the fungal kingdom. And these are two fungi that um, have emerged uh, previously out of nowhere. We didn't know they exist. They had to be uh, given names um, and investigated from the bottom up to really understand what they were, what type of fungus, um, and, and why they were causing these very aggressive uh, um, disease die-offs in, in wildlife. So in that inset here, we've got a little brown bat in North America and you can see the white fungus growing on its wing membranes and also its muzzle. So this is called bat white nose syndrome. And then the uh, bottom, uh, um, uh, the, the, the larger picture is a very famous photograph by the wonderful wildlife photographer, Joel Sartori. And um, you know, this, this uh, article by a journalist says it very, very well. Fungi have long been seen as the least interesting pathogens but two catastrophes in the animal world have changed that view. So, I mean, white nose syndrome has been quite extraordinary. It was uh, discovered in the um, winter of 2004, 2005 in one cave in upper New York state. 
And this is one of the original photographs that came from that cave. So little brown bats uh, roost together in very, very large hibernacula, many hundreds of thousands of bats clustered together. And uh, these cavers entered the cave and every bat was dead, just piles of, of, of dead bat corpses um, uh, around the around the around the cave and you know they'd lost the entire entire roost the next year um it had spread to four caves and then the year after that you, you can see the cluster growing in uh, in in upper new york state in each of these caves that uh, the 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 fungus um the bats had died they had um the fungus growing uh, growing all over them. So the fungus was identified and named. It's called Pseudogymnoascus destructens. And it has just been blasting off across the United States ever since. So here we go. And that's where we are now in 2018. And you can see the um, that white nose syndrome has jumped all the way over to the Western, uh, Western freeboard. So this little uh, species of, of bat is going to be functionally extinct in um, in in uh, in North America. Um, very very high um, lethality, and there's another five um, other species. So what do we know about Pseudogymnoascus destructens? Well, it appears to have come from Europe. It appears to be one genome, so one clonal genome got there to that original cave. We don't know how it got there. Probably. On the boot of a caver, um, and uh, and and it's uh, it's it's uh, it's an interesting fungus because it's uh, it's light sensitive. It's missing one enzyme that fixes its genome when it gets struck by UV um, UV light. Uh, that's the enzyme UVE. So it's um it's a fungus that loves the dark. So it appears to be really well adapted to cave environments. And European bats have it; they just don't die of it. Uh, presumably, they've got a long, um, a long evolutionary history with uh, with with the fungus. But what I'm going to talk about is is my specific uh, focus and interest, which is um, this plague on frogs. So the the Anthropocene hasn't been uh, hasn't been kind to biodiversity. Uh, we're a, we're a very we you know, we have manipulated environments in our favour. And uh, there's been a, you know, a terrible loss of biodiversity. Uh, the UN Secretary General made a very strong statement to that effect today. But what do we do know is that amphibians have been uh, they ha they've been hit harder than any of the other vertebrate taxa. So the red list is a it's a kind of a health check on the planet. It's you know how how well is your species doing in relation to all others, and amphibians are doing very very poorly. There have been a, far more extinctions than uh, in other groups of vertebrates, and their extinction rate is ten thousand times above background. Now, this can't all be explained by the um, by just habitat loss or pesticides. You know there was there's something else that was going on. It was that. Um, what else was going on was really, really foxing uh, um, herpetologists who studied amphibians. And it was only really in a, uh, the, a conference in Canterbury in 1989 where the herpetologists of the world came together and they were comparing stories and, you know, you know, people were saying, well, I, you know, I used to study this, 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 this frog and it's now really rare or it's completely existent. And, uh, uh, and this is a really great example, is the Monteverde golden toad, Encilius peregrinus. So this uh, species was discovered in 1966, and the um, the last member of it was seen in 1989. Now, this uh, golden toad, you could see it from kilometers away. I mean, it really shone like the sun, but it was only on one very small mountain top um, and, uh, and, and in Costa Rica. And it just vanished. It was like an alien abduction. No one could figure out where the golden toads had gone. So this golden toad went extinct in 1989. And, you know, there was what, what, what um, scientists cottoned onto was that there was a there was a kind of a wave like movement of declines and extinctions which moved through Central America, starting in Costa Rica and uh, eventually jumping over the Panama Canal. 
So this is a really um, famous graph that is uh, published in PNAS in 2006 by Karen Lips. And Karen, uh, she knew that this wave like amphibian loss was going to strike her study sites at some point. So she just went there and religiously counted her transects. And she went out and with her students, she just counted amphibians. And then you can see here in 2004, the biodiversity of the El Cope site just drops off the edge of a cliff. Boom. And here we have David Attenborough. He um, uh, he's in his wonderful program, Life in Cold Blood. He documents the golden frog going extinct in the wild in 2008. So that's the last wave of the golden frog. So these, um, these, these, this wave-like emergence of biodiversity loss, um, mass mortalities and declines was replicated in other parts of the planet. So this wasn't just a Central American phenomenon. Um, what we have here in Australia is Rio Batrachis, the gastric uh, mouth, um, the gastric brooding frog. These were had a really wonderful biology. There was two species. They used to um, home their tadpoles in their stomachs and uh, their tadpoles would develop and eventually metamorphose and then they'd vomit out perfectly formed froglets. So an absolutely unique and extraordinary biology. Both of those species went extinct. So we're never going to find out exactly how Rio Batrachis um, did this astonishing uh, gastric bruising trick. But, um, you know, the, this, this, this kind of uh, accumulation of dire and drastic uh, stories just kept on spiraling through the 90s and into the 2000s. So we have the, um, the, 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 the mass declines of the mountain chicken frogs um, in the Caribbean, the Caribbean basin, um, islands like such as Montserrat, um, and then the, 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 Sierra, the Sierra frogs in the 1990s, a very numerous species, um, went from hero to zero. And then in Europe, we were, we were tracking declines in our midwife toads, elites. And then salamanders also started to go down the tubes too. So it was a, this, is, this is a global pandemic. It's a pandemic in wildlife, so it's called a panzootic. And a, to cut a very long uh, story short, eventually a fungus was discovered. And this is called Betrachochytrium dendrobatidis. And it causes a disease, amphibian chytridiomycosis. So what you see here is um, it's, it's one of those kind of ancient basal fungal lineages. It's a swimming organism, it's flagellate, but it has this unfortunate um, propensity to settle in amphibian skin. And amphibians, of course, uh, have this unique interaction with their environment where they take in water through their skin and they take in oxygen through their skin. So they're very porous organisms. So anything that interferes with their skin function is going to have some health impact. And boy, does BD, as we call it because of that very long name, um, have, a, have, a, have a dreadful impact. Now, the uh, scientist that I'm showing there is, um, is, is, is Joyce Longcore. She, has, um, she, she here won the Golden Goose Award. The Golden Goose Award is, is uh, the award for scientists who are involved in research that people have pointed the finger and said, that's never going to be worth anything. You're just, you know, why are you doing that? Well, she, uh, Joyce, studied chytrids. So she was the one scientist that was able to look at this new pathogen and go, you know what, that's not a bacteria and that's not a virus, that's not a whatever, it's a chytrid. And um, can we just see the video now of, uh, of, of um, BD in action? So it's one of the first videos I took, so it's not very good, but you'll be able to get the general flavor of how unusual this organism is. And you can see these little zoo spores um, zooming around. Thank you very much. Um, so it's uh, it just shows how how motile these these organisms are, and you know you probably came into this talk thinking, yeah, I know what a fungus looks like. Well, you know this is what a real fungus looks like because this is one of the ancient uh, the ancient um, fungal lineages. So here you have little kind of um, uh, tadpole-like zoospores hunting tadpoles, effectively, strangely circular. Um, 
And uh, so I came into this story, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, when I was working in John Taylor's lab in Berkeley, and and he, you know, that's a that was a fungal lab, and they were starting to to get interested in this this new kitchen thing. This was in the late 1990s, but it was only when I came to Europe, and uh, and 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 started to talking to herpetologists here, where they said, yeah, yeah, you know, we have this problem too. Um, our 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 frogs are uh, are really suffering from a well, they're. They're dying in in very large numbers. They're not coming back. And so my original scientist that I um, uh, started collaborating with was Jaime Bosch, who worked uh, in the mountains uh, near Madrid. And he studied the calls of Elites obstetricans. And um, his whole PhD was based on it. And then, and then you know, there were, there were hundreds of animals one year, and then the next year there were tens of animals. And then the year after that, there was one. And then, you know, his, his PhD research bounded because uh, his, his study species died. So Elites, well, you'll find them in these wonderful um, montane lakes. This is the Pyrenees. It's one of our favorite study sites uh, in the Western Pyrenees. And this is, this is uh, an extraordinary amount of kind of amphibian biodiversity thrashing around. There's very short seasons uh, for these lakes. They, they kind of me melt in, um, you know, May, June, and they'll refreeze in, um, you know, around about, uh, around about September. So you get this real blast off of, um, of, of, of amphibians of, uh, of, of several species, lots and lots of midwife toads. And uh, this is me in August. And we'd just go to these lakes and we'd walk around them and we'd unfortunately see a lot of this. And this is, this is um, a, a midwife, midwife toad, which is metamorphosing from the lakes. You can see this. Um, this one in the centre of the picture is alive, but it's 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 not looking healthy. I can see from here that its back legs aren't functioning correctly, and uh, it has this kind of fairly dry texture to its skin. And then we have its two compatriots on either side, which have succumbed to chytridiomycosis. And um, you know, we've been going to these lakes for the past fifteen years, and we just you know harvest these uh, these poor corpses um every year as the animals emerge from the lakes and die so some of these lakes it's now very hard to find the species other uh, some of the other of the lakes have uh, have actually come back in frequency so you know there seems to be some interesting kind of heterogeneity in in whether they survive or die which we're uh, which we're which, which we're trying to understand but um this uh, emergence of BD has been a global event, and the ferocity of it has uh, been was was documented last year by Ben Sheely in this um, in this in this essentially in an accountancy paper. Um, he accounted for the impact that uh, the emergence of BD has had on uh, on um, frog biodiversity and salamanders as well. Um, and the majority of the impact has been felt in Mesoamerica and South America, but also o Oceania, Australia. But that one part of the world where you won't find BD causing a problem is in Asia. So that's a, that's a bit of a spoiler, isn't it? Um, these graphs here show that the peak of these uh, the global amphibian declines caused by BD peaked in the 1980s. Um, and this graph here shows when BD was discovered. Um, but the amphibian declines started happening, you know, sometime around the 1970s. So it's, it's, this appears to be a 20, 20th century problem, you know, starting in the, in the, the late 60s, the early 1970s, peaking in the 80s, but still grumbling on. And, um, uh, this is the range of, um, of, of species that, sh that have been impacted. And what Ben was able to show was the decline has been, I mean, not all species of amphibian are equally um, impacted by BD. Some are tolerant, the, the fungus can't touch them. Others are, um, they're susceptible, but they survive, you know, they, they, they seem to do okay. Uh, others are very, very susceptible and they, they, they can decline to very low levels or go extinct. So 
specifically these very susceptible species are large bodied ones they live in wet parts of the world um they live in watery places i mean it's worth remembering i mean bd needs water to complete its life cycle because it has those little swimming zoo spores which hunt amphibians so you need water um and those species which are range restricted with now na narrow elevational range not a lot of space to move or go um if bd gets into those regions then they're toast uh, and it's some species have uh that were very heavily struck by bd have started to climb back and show signs of recovery but it's a fairly minor uh percentage and from a point of view of the kind of ecosystems that these snakes that these frogs are in we're starting to see the impact of driving down amphibian biodiversity to very low levels so this is um, a really interesting paper that came out of Karen Lips's lab last uh, um, this year tropical snake diversity collapses after widespread amphibian loss and what uh, this group were able to show was that before BD arrived in those Central American forests. There was a certain amount of snake biodiversity. And then after, they'd lost a lot. And um, so there were fewer snakes, but the, the, the species of snakes that were there were also generally thinner. Um, so there's four species on the left. Some of those specialize on eating amphibian eggs. So there was less food for them to eat. Um, and some seem to have, uh, have compensated in other ways and actually doing better. Perhaps there's more food around with these, uh, with those other snakes um, declining in in, um, in abundance. So the ecosystem ramifications of losing all those frogs are, of course, now spilling out into the wider ecosystem. It's, this has been an incredibly damaging event. So this is the first lesson. Fungi are worse invaders than even cats, rats, and other infectious diseases. These are the worst pathogens um, from the point of view of biodiversity that we've ever seen. And those of you fo who follow Ed Young on Twitter, uh, he said it very well. Never before in recorded history has a single disease burned down so much of the tree of life. New estimates show that the doomsday fungus called BD has caused the decline of over 500 species and the extinction of at least 90. So um, Ed Young gets it. So. Here we have a fungus which has blasted off around the world. It's very damaging, but where, when, and how did BT emerge? So this is where we have put a lot of effort into hunting chytrids for genome sequencing. And this little video that we're about to show now just um, uh, depicts a rather fun uh, trip to the um, uh, the the, the, field, uh, the French um, uh, the French rainforests above Brazil. Um, in French, French Guiana, that's the word, I was, the country I was hunting for. You can play that now. There we go. There's, uh, there's Priya and Elodie. That's the helicopter taking us into the research site. You can't drive here. It's 400 kilometers from anywhere. And that's the, um, the poison dart frogs that we're hunting for. You've got to catch them. And from them, you take a little tiny biopsy and you spend all night polishing that biopsy of skin to try and get the fungus to get the BD off the amphibian and into culture. So that's what that one research trip um, was, was, was aimed at doing, was catching BD from those frogs in the French Guiana and rainforest. Now we, we sampled upwards of 800 animals there and we got two isolates. So it nearly didn't work, but it did work enough for us to start to get, to get the fungus into culture to then genome sequence it. Now, our group and many other groups around the world have been recapitulating that process to catch BD from the amphibians. And then we've genome sequenced them and we've aligned all those genomes and we've built a phylogeny. And that phylogeny has given us some really, really interesting answers. So for a start, it's just shown us that not all BD is the same. So here we have a very interesting African BD, BD cape which is also on the island of Mallorca. So it's been introduced there from Africa. And we, we've, uh, we've published on, on how that happened. Um, there's BD Asia and Brazil. So this is the one genotype which is uh, in, in Brazil, but there's also Asia. 
There's very interesting lineage that we've only ever picked up from Korea. But then this was the real um, uh, eureka moment was when we saw that this one genotype was all across the planet. So this is BDGPL, the global panzoartic lineage. And it's very aggressive because those are survival curves there um, for frogs that we've infected with the different lineages and the ones that have BDGPL die a lot faster. And it's absolutely everywhere. And this genotype is also associated with all those signature die-offs. So this is this is the lineage which has been um, driving the global um, panzootic uh, in amphibians. So what this, uh, this genome sequencing data has allowed us to do is to look at the diversity of all of this, these genotypes of BD, which you've been able to hunt out of the forests and genome sequence. And despite us only finding seven isolates of uh, BD from, from uh, Korea, this has more nucleotide diversity than we're finding anywhere else by a very, very, very long way. So what this is, what this is pointing us to is the ancestral population of BD. Um, it looks like this fungus has spent a very long time in Asia. It has very high diversity there. It, it, um, its genome shows all the signatures of not nothing exciting happening to it. You know, it's safe and it's at home. <coughs> Whereas these other lineages, this is a, a population genetic statistic called Tajima's D. What Tajima's D is shows whether your genome has gone through some form of bottleneck or expansion. And of course, when you move a microbe out of its um, home and you splotch it somewhere else in the world, you've, you've grabbed one and then you've allowed it to expand very fast. So that's going to give you a very disturbed um, uh, Tajima's D pattern. And that's what you see here for all of those globalized lineages, Asia 2, Cape and GPL, not Asia 1. So that looks like, um, so this is also as evidence that Asia is the, is the home of, of BD. And then what you can also do with the, the sort of genetic diversity that we've been harvesting from the chytrid is to date when um, the, the most likely time for its emergence. To do that, we use a molecular clock and calculate a time to most recent common ancestor, often called TMRCA. So essentially what you do is you need samples that have been um, of the fungus that have been harvested from different time points. So you need a frog that was collected back in the 1990s and one that was collected now. And you just count all the differences between those two. And that will give you a rate at which the BD genome uh, clock ticks. And that's what that little um, line is showing there. So once you've estimated that rate, then you can apply it to your phylogeny and get an estimate from when the genome um, expanded. And so our genomic estimate is around about 1950, which, um, was an extremely good result because that accurately accurately merges on to the estimate that Ben Sheely um, uh, came up with for his his observed extinction and decline events, and that's the bottom plot there, showing the molecular estimate being superimposed on the decline data. So we're now very sure that BD GPL emerged across the planet sometime in the early twentieth century. So this is the lesson two. Um, there are hot spots of fungal diversity exist that are pathogen pumps. And uh, this, is, uh, this isn't this is the out of Asia origin of, uh, of BD. And this was the, the cover of science in, when we published that in 2018. And um, this is a widely traded creature. It's the um, Bombina or orientalis. Um, and this, is, this species is probably one of the vectors of BD around the world. So we're, what we've also been able to show, and this is another big contribution of our genome data, is that the global vector of BD is the amphibian trade. So it would be, we move a surprisingly large amount of frogs around the planet. Um, 
And a lot of this is food trade. So here we have North American bullfrogs being farmed in Taiwan. It's this, um, picture, uh, a picture of a, a bullfrog farm. You'll find these all over the world. Um, Uruguay has a spectacular number of them. Um, and, uh, you know, these animals are, tend to be infected with BD. They're a very resistant species, um, but they're moved around the planet. And what we were able to show from our genome phylogenies was that well, that, that range of species along the bottom, those were species of amphibian that we found in the trade. So we would have uh, PhD students at the Heathrow Animal Reception Center um, or going to, to wet markets, and they would, uh, you know, they would successfully isolate BD and genome and sequence them. And we have recovered all of the genomic diversity of BD. All those lineages I showed have been, we have found them actually in traded animals. So this is this is proof that we're moving BD around the planet in real time. And um, you can also we also see those those arrows on the graph um, on the on the map also show uh, genotypes which must have moved very recently because they're so highly related. So we um, we move BD around the world. Um, but this happened in the early half of the 20th century. So, you know, mere culpa, we didn't know about the organism, you know, stuff happens. Once is more fortune, but twice, well, that starts to become carelessness, doesn't it? So what I'm showing here is a fire salamander, a European fire salamander, and you'll be able to see the ulcerations on its lip. This is not a well animal. So, when this, these fire salamanders were detected dying in huge numbers in the Netherlands, they all tested negative using the known tests for BD. So this graph here, I mean, the fire salamanders are, are, are a rare and unique species in, in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands, the, the herpetologists there count them every year. And it was in 2010 that there were a reasonable abundance the next year they were found dying in great quantities, and essentially all of them, um, all of all of the all of them, uh, all of them died. And this map here then shows um, the salamander populations that also started dying. This is again was a, a expanding wave like event. The Trachochytrium salamandrivorans was discovered and named. It's uh, it's, a, it's the sister uh, taxa to um, to BD, and it. Uh, it, it's, it's found in Asia. Um, it's found in Vietnam. It's in salamanders there. They, they thrive um, with B-cell. But it's when these organisms are moved out of their native ranges where they've had a long co-evolutionary history with the amphibians that we then get into trouble. So BD and B-cell have been in Asia for at least 40 million years. They're very ancient fungi and the amphibians there are happy as Larry with them. But when you move them out of those ancestral ranges, that's when the trouble starts. So the lesson three really is that we live a in a globalized and bio-insecure world. This has profound consequences for biodiversity and health, both animals and plants. And, you know, if I'd said this a year ago, you'd probably have gone, yeah, okay, I understand. But saying it this year in 2020, you now viscerally understand, don't you? Because you have just been through a panzootic that originated from some form of wet market in Asia and has smashed its way around the world. So this year we're feeling very sympathetic to amphibians because we're experiencing pretty much exactly the same process, bio insecurity. And this is a Pandora's box that uh, we need to put the lid on, don't we? So the lid, what can we do? Well. This is a, the Burn Convention. Um, they've just run this program in 2019 called Think Outside the Box. And, you know, you can go to a pet shop and you can buy amphibians and you can keep them in Vivaria, but they may have something that you don't expect, like BD or B cell. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to accept that those amphibians, they need to be kept inside their terraria and not released into the wider environment. Bad things happen when microbes emerge. 
So exotic animals and pets uh, are just, you know, they're, they're risky. They carry diseases. You need to be responsible. Um, they certainly shouldn't go into the environment. The water that they've been uh, kept in really shouldn't be in the environment. So um, don't release those pets into the wild. <sighs> you know, is, is this going to work? I'm not sure. Um, what can we really do? Well, the nuclear option is trade bans. Now, B cell, as you'll have seen, is in Asia, it's in Europe, but it isn't, hasn't been found in the Americas. And it would be a very bad thing if B cell invaded the Americas because there's an enormous amount of salamander biodiversity there. Um, there's more uh, in the Appalachians. There's 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 more raw mass of salamanders than there are of of white-tailed deer biomass, and uh, you know if B cell rips through that, then that would radically rewire that ecosystem, much like we saw with um, the snakes and frogs in Central America. So America now has a ban on uh, on 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 importing um, salamanders and. Um, and, and that's in direct response to, to what the scientists have found out. So to fight chytrid fungi um, in their native environments, uh, scientists have uh, set up captive breeding projects. So this is a Smithsonian group um, working on the golden frogs, Atalopus zatiki, in Panama. So is this a shipping container? No, it's not. It is, in fact, a biosecure golden frog breeding pod. Um, it's insulated from with is biosecure from the external environment so the atelopus the last atelopus that would take were taken out of the wild um before bd struck them have been housed and grown originally in hotel rooms but now in these uh, golden frog breeding pods and um in, in large numbers so these animals could potentially be released into the wild at some point when and this is the million dollar question when we knew, know what to do about BD. So what can we do about BD? Well, there's no simple answer to this question because what I'm describing here is an in emerging invasive organism in a very complex um, uh, uh, biodiverse system where absolutely everything matters. And you don't need to go into the details of this diagram here, but what I've tried to capture um, in, this, uh, in this recent review article is the fact that everything matters to some extent. So the abiotic factors, the uh, temperature, the UV exposure, altitude, rainfall, this um, determines to an extent whether an amphibian survives or dies from amphibian, um, from, from BD. Uh, there are um, bacteria on the frog's surface. Those can kill BD, so those probiotic interactions may um, may aid in an amphibian survival. Alternative hosts, you know, there are outside of amphibians. There are other creatures which probably can be infected by D BD. It's found in crayfish, so they may amplify the infection if they're present. Um, and then amphibians have this, you know, really complex immunity. So perhaps they will uh, this will evolve through time it appears to be in some populations and the amphibians themselves will become resilient to chytrid so every box in here is a live topic of research on this bd amphibian interaction and um one day the hope is that we'll be able to understand this enough that we'll be able to release those golden frogs from their biosecure breeding pods out into the world so Unfortunately, this is what we've seen a lot of, and this is what I've been talking about. I mean, frogs dying in huge numbers around the planet. So um, this is uh, when when me and Chris were talking about this. Chris Chris is a compulsive cartooner, and he always was way back when we were at school. And uh, I'm very happy to see that he's continued to to, to draw these these wonderful il illustrations. But you know, really what the kind of research effort is doing is we're trying to turn this into this. In some way, we need to stop the emergence of chytrids and where the chytrids are to alter the ecosystems in some way so that the amphibians can recover their previous resilience. And amphibians are incredibly resilient creatures because they've been on the planet for 400 million years with fungi, you know, 
this, this has got to be possible somehow. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for listening. And um, are there any questions, Chris? Jack, I can't hear you. You're on mute. We are on mute. Apologies for that. I was meant to click the button a little bit earlier, just before we get to the Q&A. And thank you so much, uh, Matt, for that fantastic talk. There are a lot of questions, and Chris has collated them all. But just before we get to that, just a quick reminder that we're looking forward to seeing everyone in two weeks' time for the next of our Visions of Nature talk, which will be given by Professor Fitz Volrath from our very own Department of Zoology, and it's going to be on the topic of spider webs and silks. So we, if you would like to hear a little bit more about the form and function of spider webs and how they're made and how they evolve, we look forward to seeing you at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of December, and the link for that is up in the chat. And at that point, I will zoom you over to Chris, who's got all the questions. Well, thanks very much, Matt. It's absolutely fantastic to, to hear about your work. Um, and I love particularly like the, the way you remind us of all what a, what a visceral feeling it is to, you know, to, to actually understand the damage that these uh, these pandemics actually actually cause. Um, we had a couple of really, really interesting questions, actually, about um, the effects, uh, the effects on the, on the ecology of the, the world of, of the death of, of amphibians. Um, and, and actually, we had... Uh, we had um, Marianne, I think, who was who asked, uh, what, are, "What are the ecological implications of such a drastic decline in frogs? I mean, what, what effects are it going to have on other species? Uh, are we going to get a plague of mosquitoes?" She asked. Well, I mean, oh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, and it's a and it's a huge area. I mean, we're all trying to value ecosystems. Um, from the point of view of bats, someone actually came up with a, a number a dollar value for losing bats to bat whiteness no syndrome. And it was something like $10 billion a year. Uh, that's because those mosquitoes require controlling when there's no bats. So that's, that was, that's financially a very expensive event. Much harder to do for frogs. And, you know, we knew that losing the frogs would be having some impact. Um, but it took decades before that research was you know was done and the numbers were you know brought together to to show that the the snakes in central america were 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 declining as a as a secondary effect of losing the amphibians so i suppose the answer to the question is we now know that there are impacts I mean, we suspected that there were before but now we actually know we're, we're losing we're losing snakes that's only in one system um in these morphed fragile, less biodiverse mountain ecosystems where we're losing, um, losing the elites and perhaps the, the fire salamanders too, too. Well, I just think it, it's going to take a long time to shake out till we actually really start to see, uh, you know, what, what happens, you know. I mean, birds eat a lot of tadpoles, so perhaps this is going to, you know, have some effect on, on birds, you know, and... I mean, so it's a, we don't know, um, but we do know something's going to happen. Something will give. And uh, this is, this is the imperative that's driving us forward to, to find some solution to these uh, biodiversity crises. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. You, you, you seem to be just taking that, that, that amphibians actually tend to be more on the diet of, of a wider range of a variety of, uh, of other creatures than, than bats tend to be um, in a lot of ways. Uh, so I suppose that the effects are going to be pretty, Pretty tough. Um, and then I read another question from Lauren, actually, um, who asked, you know, um, how does the, the fungus continue to spread if it's so lethal? I mean, generally, pathogens, when they're very lethal, you know, they, they, they wipe themselves out by wiping out the host. So, so what is it that really, um, you know, sort of gives chytrid that, that edge? Oh, that's wonderful. That's a, that's a proper epidemiology question. So how does BD... Uh, dodge den density dependence. You know, when when your host gets rare, then 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 you'll go rare. And you know, um, in kind of the kind of the more kind of traditional epidemiological models, you always lose the pathogen when the host numbers drop down to a low level, and those chains of transmission um, stutter. And and essentially, that's um, that's what lockdowns are doing with COVID, aren't they? 
I mean, we're making humans rare by being unconnected. Um, you, um, this doesn't happen with BD. And the reason is, is when you have, I don't know, 200 species in a rainforest, you're gonna find that there are 50 which are really, really susceptible and they just go down fast. You lose them in the first year. And then there's another 50 which um, get really sick and uh, low, low density, but they're still there. Um, and then there's this group of amphibians, the res resilient ones, a bit like those bullfrogs that I showed the picture of, they're tanks and they're absolutely soaked in BD and they're pumping it into the environment, but they just, you know, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do anything to them. So, you know, you, even when those susceptible species are rare to extinct, this BD zoo spores still have a home and they're just being, pump, they're being pumped out into the environment. So it never goes away. And at that point, it becomes less like an infection and more like a background threat, like uh, radiation or something like that. It's just a hazard that's, that's always there in the forest as long as there's some resistant species. So I so, uh, we have to tackle those resistant species somehow. You know, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by the, the, the video you, you showed us of the... Uh, of the fungal spores actually hunting down tadpoles. That's, that seemed, seemed pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Um, actually, there's, a, there's a, one thing you can do there is you can release, so diatoms and copepods like uh, Daphnia, they will hunt the zoo spores. So one of the mitigation measures is potentially to release um, zoo, spores hunter, zoo spore hunters into the water. I like that one. Oh, fantastic. That's nice. nice. There's hope from another corner of, uh, of the biological world. Um, there's... Um, Another, there's an interesting comment actually um, from Stephen um, Bennett, who, who was saying, you know, 20 years ago we, we would have had dozens of, of frogs in our garden pond, uh, especially early spring uh, when they were mating, and now we get virtually none and no frogs spawned for the last three years. Um, says the mutinous pond seem okay, are they immune and resistant? So I was, I was wondering what the level of uh, infection of, of diseases for uh, a particular fungus for, for in, uh, in the UK was. Yeah, so UK is very interesting. I mean, there's been two really good national surveys done for BD. It's here, but it's very patchy, and it doesn't appear to be doing very well. So, you know, the, some ecosystems aren't great for BD, and, and you know, they, you know in, the, in the UK, there's something that's clobbering it fast enough so that it's not becoming a problem. And it might be Daphne combing out the zoo, the zoo spores from the water or some bacteria. Um, there appears to be another pathogen which is more of a problem, and that's ranavirus. So there are emerging viral infections that have been that are moving around the world and do impact amphibian populations. They're probably being moved more by the fish trade and, and other forms of aquaculture. But uh, there are research projects, um, certainly run by the um, Institute of Zoology in London Zoo, tracking emerging ranaviruses, and that's probably what's. Uh, been the major hit for British common frogs. Climate change is also um, not a great one. Amphibians need very cold winters to, um, to get them through the period when there's not a lot of food. If an amphibian hibernates um, and it's too warm and it comes out in the springtime and it's, it's often too weak to breed successfully. And so there's, uh, that might be another hammer and perhaps also pesticides and fungicides aren't great. You know. There's a lot of a lot of stuff hitting amphibians. Poor amphibians. And just before we go on to many more of your questions, just a quick reminder that the Oxford University Museum of Natural History is a charity and as well as putting on public engagement events like this one, we also house seven million specimens, including the mighty dinosaur behind me and also host research groups and all sorts of other wonderful events. Now, these events rely on your donations. And if you are able to, please do consider donating to the museum. There is a link up in the chat now. And with that, I'll hand back to Chris for the rest of the Q&A. Lovely. Well, thank you, Jack. That's fantastic. Um, we've, we've had a few other questions about bat fungi more generally. Um, and Terry actually asked who's, who's obviously fascinated by the, the relationship between plants and fungi. Um, and, you know, fungi has actually been so important in, in keeping the world alive, as well as, you know, sort of being some nasty pathogens about. Mm -hmm. But it also, um, these mycorrhizal relationships between 
fungi and plants. Do you um, do they favour the fungi more than the plant? And, um, and what stops the plant from attacking the fungi, or the fungi from attacking the plant? I know it's it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's it's what could, what is a symbiosis could it so so easily become a parasitism. Um, I mean, the plant appears to genetically be able to genetically control the relationship very well. Plants do this. I mean, they do them with the rhizobium um, bacteria as bacteria as well. They you know they'll select for that those nitrogen fixing bacteria with uncanning accuracy. Um, and they seem to be able to, to allow the good fungi in, um, but keep the bad fungi out. So there's, there's some form of very intimate genetic relationship between the plant and the fungus. And in fact, the kind of cutting edge science of the moment is actually observing how plants and fungi swap genetic information through these um, exosomes, essentially cytoplasmic transfer with RNA and all sorts of messengers. So there's an enormous amount of communication between these organisms that we're just beginning to um, understand. And I think the, the answer to that question is is going to be there somewhere. Um, but yes, the wood wide web is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a fascinating association and it's very, very delicately balanced somehow. Right, I've just just read um, Merlin Sheldrake's book, which is fascinating for anybody who's, who's interested in in mycology. Now, clearly, we need more mycologists out there because you know, so they're, they're so fun, they find they're so fundamental to uh, to life on our planet. Um, but getting back to fungal pathogens, um, I had a, an interesting question um, from Andy Pedley, who who sort of asked about bats, and he said. It, is, is it only just one species of bat that's, that's affected by the white nose syndrome, or is, 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 does it kind of cross all the bats? Can you tell us more about that? So, in, yeah, great questions. Uh, these are all great questions. Um, in America, it's bat white nose syndrome affects five species of bats. Um, it's when they roost very, very close together and the temperatures are very low, essentially, they're, they're, they're in deep torpor. Um, they're close together, then the fungus really cranks along. And so it's the species that do have that kind of hibernating behavior that are being really heavily hit. Those, the, small, the little brown bats um, are being hit hardest. The other four species are declining as well. Um, but then I don't think they're predicted to go extinct because when they become rare, then the fungus becomes less aggressive because it's a density dependent. There is a density dependent aspect um, to the association, I believe. Um, in Europe, what we find with our bats is they don't roost together in those numbers um, and they tend to be a little bit bigger. So th this could it could be an example where the fungus has driven the evolution of uh, European bats to be a little bit more solitary and a little bit meatier um, in an, you know, as, as a way of, uh, of surviving, um, you know, a surviving um, PD, as it's called. North oh, America no. never met it, and that's that's why they're so susceptible. But another fantastic uh, example of how uh, how fungus can drive evolution as well. Which, uh, you know, I particularly like your your, your uh, um, description of, of compost earth and you know, the yeah. rise of the mammals, which I which I love as as a theory. Um, but um, we did have an, an, another one, which was which was obviously um, closer to home, which was um, from. I think it was actually from Amir, and, and, and Amir asked, um, how likely is a fungal epidemic outbreak and how hard would it be to combat? And I think by that he was thinking about humans. You know, uh, Do we actually, as well, have to be worried about ourselves as well as the rest of the planet being, being affected by these, uh, these fungal outbreaks? Yes, yeah, so there's some really interesting stories in, in that space. Um, the, the, there is a new fungal infection that's doing... Um, Pretty much what BD has has uh, has has done. Um, obviously, we're not dying from it in in enormous numbers, but it's spreading very successfully in humans. It's called Candida auris. It was discovered in um, a patient's ear in Japan in 2009. So one individual, and it's now all over the world. Um, Candida auris is a really bad news when it gets into an intensive care unit because it's resistant to the normal disinfectants. So you have to clear out the patients and you have to deep clean everything using hydrogen peroxide or maldehyde. You have to really blast the place to get rid of candida auris. Um, 
So, I mean, that's um, that's been now being carried by humans and is transmitting between humans. And, you know, we're fine unless we get sick and then it can be a problem. So there are new fungi. They are exploring humans and they are also res evolving resistance to the drugs that we use. And so just like uh, bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics, fungi will also um evolve resistance to antifungals and they'll do that in crops against the far sprays that farmers use but also in the in the clinics against the drugs that doctors use so we're involved in the same arms race um uh, with fungi that we are in, in in with bacteria to some extent oh that's uh, yes yeah frightening frightening thought um i mean do they do they evolve relatively quickly fungi or good workers on that they don't evolve as quickly as bacteria, and the main reason for that is bacteria are very good at shuffling um, antimicrobial resistance genes horizontally by swapping plasmids. So if you've got the antimicrobial gene on that plasmid, then it can jump across species. Fungi are much have much higher fidelity, and they tend to breed with one another, but they won't do this horizontal transmission. But if, the, if you get antimicrobial resistance in a particular fungal species, then and and that's uh, and you keep selection on. Then it will expand and and um, you'll 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 have to you'll have to deal with it at some point. And we're we're at that stage with a lung fungus called Aspergillus fumigatus, which is something that you find in compost heaps, but has res evolved resistance to a class of chemicals called the azoles. And doctors, they they that's the, our main. Uh, antifungal drug and if you've got an azole resistant aspergillus then you your clinician's got to fight on their hands yeah and that's a that's a particularly nasty rot, nasty uh, rotting variety that i i understand as well um so um, i think really to to, to end up my last uh, point would be if, if people wanted to get involved in amphibian conservation mm -hmm. and they wanted to sort of try and help um you know, sort of protect against against chytrid or or improve the health of the planet. What, what would your points be to that? I'm def there's there's so much we can do to Im Im improve the environment for amphibians, and I would just you know get get involved in a group that's um that's I think there's the Million Ponds project, isn't there? I mean, we just need more pond. We need more breeding breeding sites for amphibians and. Uh, you know, so just just involving yourself in the natural history of the animal in Britain, I think there's a lot of opportunities for that. There's some really good charities such as Frog Life UK, um, and they do they do fantastic work. So uh, so so get involved with Frog Life, um, and uh, and and London Zoo does does some amazing work as well. So you know, it's I think, I think all going on. I, I think we've got some uh, you know some uh, we've got plenty of uh, of. Um, People viewing tonight from around the world as well, and I think there's a—is it the Amphibian Arc um, organisation where you can get involved in in conservation in uh, amphibians in in South America and North America and, and places like that? Yeah, there are international organisations such as Amphib Arc. Um, there's also um, Save the Frog as well, which is very active in Africa and um, and Bangladesh. Um, and uh, yeah, there's it's. Uh, there are there are charities which are working specifically on on amphibians and not other species, so they're very focused and effective, and a lot of their effort goes into habitat restoration um, as 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 the, as the best primary way of conserving amphibians. We still haven't got a great way of dealing with chytrids, I'm afraid. So, yeah, like many things, the answer is just protecting the environment, making space for nature, and sort of yeah. trying to give a bit of a helping hand. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic, Matt. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really nice to, uh, to, to see you again as well. Um, but um, that's an absolutely wonderful talk, and um, I can't thank you enough. So thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and um, we'll catch up soon.